Beethoven was born in 1770 and was introduced to music at a young age by his father, who was a piano and violin teacher, as well as a talented tenor. Obsessed with music, young Beethoven became a childhood prodigy, performing his first public concert in his hometown of Bonn when he was just seven years old. He continued his musical career while learning from some of his great contemporaries, like Christian Gottlob Neef, who taught him composition. He played viola in the court orchestra and became familiar with operas, several of which were by Mozart. He continued to study Mozart along with Bach and other famous composers. By 1791, Beethoven had composed several of his own works and began publishing these compositions just a few years later. In 1795, Beethoven performed publicly in Vienna for the first time. He had developed a reputation with the piano and wowed crowds with either Piano Concerto No. 1 or Piano Concerto No. 2. All of Beethoven's achievements mentioned so far far were done with seemingly excellent hearing. But that soon changed. Starting around 1796, we have references of Beethoven mentioning in letters hearing buzzing noises. But it wouldn't be until 1801 when we have documented evidence that he had been gradually going deaf. Specifically, Beethoven wrote to his physician stating, For the last three years, my hearing has grown steadily weaker. I can give you some idea of this peculiar deafness when I must tell you that in the theatre I have to get very close to the orchestra to understand the performers, and that from a distance I do not hear the high notes of the instruments and the singers' voices. Sometimes, too, I hardly hear people who speak softly. The sound I can hear, it is true, but not the words, and yet, if anyone shouts, I can't bear it. It isn't known precisely when he went deaf. There are documented instances of people needing to shout in his ear in order for Beethoven to hear them in the 1810s, and his hearing continued to decline from there. It is known that Beethoven continued seeking fruitless medical advice and treatments for his hearing up until 1822, after which the composer finally accepted that his hearing was never going to improve. Beethoven's music, which is generally split into three periods, reflects the gradual decline in his hearing. The early period lasts from Beethoven's childhood to around 1803, when he had both the first and second symphonies under his belt, in addition to the accomplishments previously described. During this period, he could mostly hear, and his music was characterized by higher notes. The middle period starts right around the time Beethoven's decline in hearing was becoming severe, and it ends just before the 1820s, when he was presumed to be totally dead. Deaf. This period is characterized by lower notes, with the number of high notes he used dropping significantly. As you can probably guess, since high notes were giving him trouble, he switched to lower notes so that he could better hear the music that he was creating. Compositions like Moonlight Sonata and the opera Fidelio and Six Symphonies, among others, were written during the middle period. The late period starts just before 1820. During this time, the music switched back to including more high notes. If he wasn't already fully deaf at the start of this period, he was likely close to it. The reintroduction of higher pitched notes suggests that he was resolved to listening with his inner ear rather than actually hearing the music that he was creating. This all brings us to the pinnacle of his career and one of the best known pieces of music in history which Beethoven completed during the late period. The Ninth Symphony, first performed in Theater am Kartenerte in Vienna on May 7, 1824. Wanting to go out with a bit of a bang, Beethoven saw to it that the orchestra performing his masterwork was one of the largest ever seen by the city. As an idea of just how large the group Beethoven assembled was, it's noted that not only did Beethoven require the entire Kartenerte house orchestra, but he also needed to recruit amateur musicians from the Gesellschaft der Musikfreund Society of Friends of Music in Vienna as well as various others to fill out the parts. On top of that, the chorus alone is known to have numbered nearly 100 singers. Although Beethoven was, as noted, completely deaf by this point in his career, he made it known to the powers that be that a condition of him premiering the Ninth Symphony in Vienna was that he be allowed to conduct the orchestra, a decision that understandably unnerved some, in particular the theater's Kapellmeister Michael Umlauf, who'd personally seen Beethoven previously nearly ruin the dress rehearsal of Beethoven's 1814 opera Fidelio because he couldn't properly keep time owing to his hearing. In the end, Umlauf was selected to assist Beethoven in conducting Fidelio to ensure that it went well. As for his Ninth Symphony, eventually a similar compromise was reached for Umlauf to assist Beethoven once again in his duties. Beethoven seemed satisfied with this, and Umlauf subsequently shadowed the composer while he went over the music with his hastily assembled 
Beethoven-assembled super orchestra. To ensure Beethoven couldn't mess up the performance, Umlauf reportedly secretly told the orchestra to simply humor Beethoven's instructions during the rehearsals and outright ignore him while he was conducting. On the night of the premiere itself, while the performers followed Umlauf's lead, Beethoven reportedly flailed around like one of those giant inflatable tube men while vigorously illustrating the tempo with his conducting baton. Or to quote violinist Joseph Baum about his recollection of the event, Beethoven himself conducted, that is, he stood in front of a conductor's stand and threw himself back and forth like a madman. At one moment he stretched to his full height, at the next he crouched down to the floor. He flailed about with his hands and feet as though he wanted to play all the instruments and sing all the chorus parts. According to an oft-repeated story, Beethoven's deafness prevented him from hearing the end of the performance, and as he was slightly off in his timing of his conducting, he continued to flail about after the music had stopped and initially missed the thunderous standing ovation that the performance received. While this anecdote is often exaggerated, first-hand accounts do corroborate the general story. For example, Baum alludes to this, stating, Beethoven was so excited he saw nothing that was going on about him. He paid no heed whatsoever to the burst of applause, which his deafness prevented him from hearing in any case. He had to be told when it was time to acknowledge the applause. Soprano chorister Felix Weingarter also would later recall in the book Accord, one had the tragic impression that he was incapable of following the music. Although he appeared to be reading along, he would continue to turn pages when the movement in question had already come to an end. At the performance, a man went up to him at the end of each movement, tapped him on the shoulder, and pointed to the audience. The motions of the clapping hands and the waving handkerchiefs caused him to bow, which always gave rise to great jubilation. Unsurprisingly, the response to the premiere was generally extremely glowing. For example, a correspondent of Theater Zeitung noted, After a single hearing of these immense compositions, one can scarcely say more than that one has heard them. To engage in an illuminating discussion is impossible for anyone who only attended the performance. He would later go on, All the joys and sufferings of the human soul resound here in the most varied forms. They intertwine in the marvelous magic knots that unravel and again weave themselves into new and wonderful signs. German composer Karl Czerny further wrote in a letter on June the 24th, 1824, There is surely no more significant musical news that I can write you about from our dear old Vienna than that of Beethoven finally gave repeated performances of his long-awaited concert and in the most striking manner astonished everyone who feared that after ten years of deafness he could now produce only dry, abstract works bereft of imagination. To the greatest extent, his new symphony breathes such a fresh, lively, indeed youthful spirit, so much power, innovation, and beauty as ever came from the head of this ingenious man, although several times he certainly gave the old Whigs something to shake their heads about. On that note, some critics disliked the work. For example, Richard Mackenzie Bacon wrote in an 1825 edition of the Quarterly Musical Magazine and Review, I am as zealous an admirer of the composer as any one of those who would exalt this symphony above everything else that he has written. But I have come to a decision in my own mind that until anyone can persuade me that bad is good or that black is white, I must ever consider this new symphony as the least excellent of any Beethoven has produced. As an unequal work, abounding more in noise, eccentricity, and confusion of design than in those grand and lofty touches he so well knows how to make us feel. One great excuse remains for all this want of perfection. It is to be remembered that the great composer is afflicted with an incurable disorder, deafness, which to powers like his must be a deprivation more acute and distressing than any one can possibly imagine. Very unfortunately for Beethoven, who at this point had completely lost the ability to support him Himself through his former very lucrative performance career, this debut performance of number nine was a total flop financially, with the sold out premiere earning him a paltry 420 florins, very roughly about $5,000 today. So instead of a windfall of cash to support himself with, he was stuck in the unenviable position of being short on money and on account of his deafness with diminished means of making more at his craft. Joseph Huttenbrenner, corroborated by fellow witness of the event, Anton Schindler, relays what happens when Beethoven learns of his minuscule profits on the endeavor, writing, I handed him the ticket office figures. He collapsed at the sight of them. We picked him up and laid him on the sofa. We stayed at his side until late at night. He did not ask for food or anything else and did not speak. 
Finally, on perceiving that Morpheus had gently closed his eyes, we went away. His servants found him the next morning, as we had left him, asleep and still in the clothes in which he had conducted. Schindler would go on concerning the rather ugly aftermath. Beethoven believed that he owed Umlauft, Scharpenzing, and me some thanks for our efforts. A few days after the Second Academy, therefore, he ordered a meal at the Wilder Man in the Praetor. He arrived in the company of his nephew. His brow hung round with dark clouds, acted coldly, using a biting cast tone in everything he said. An explosion was to be expected. We had only just sat down at the table when he brought the conversation round to the subject of the pecuniary results of the first performance in the theatre, blurting out point blank that he had been defrauded by the administrator Duport and me together. Umlauf and Schuppanzig made every effort to prove the impossibility of a fraud of any sort, pointing out that every piece of money had passed through the hands of the two theatre cashiers, that the figures tallied precisely, and that furthermore his nephew, on the instruction of his apocalypse, brother had superintended the cashiers in defiance of all custom. Beethoven, however, persisted in his accusation, adding that he had been informed of the fraud from a reliable quarter. Now it was time to give satisfaction for this affront. I went off quickly with Umlauf and Schuppenzing after having to endure several volleys at his voluminous person soon followed. We gathered at the Goldine's Lamb in the Leopoldstadt to continue our interrupted meal undisturbed. The furious composer, however, was left to vent his anger at the waiters and the trees and as punishment at the opulent meal alone with his nephew. Beethoven wasn't finished, however, writing this scathing letter to Schindler shortly thereafter, which reads in part, I do not accuse you of having done anything wicked in connection with the concert, but stupidity and arbitrary behavior have ruined many an undertaking. Moreover, I have, on the whole, a certain fear of you, a fear lest someday, through your action, a great misfortune may befall me. Stopped-up sluices often overflow quite suddenly, and that day in the Praetor I was convinced that, in many ways, you had hurt me very deeply. In any case, I would much rather try to repay frequently with a small gift the services you render me than have you at my table. For I confess that your presence irritates me in so many ways, I will certainly invite you occasionally. But it is impossible to have you beside me permanently, because such an arrangement would upset my whole existence. As you can see from all of this, both personally and professionally, the loss of his hearing was a crushing blow to the man. However, it was actually a boon to history. As his hearing diminished, he took to writing to communicate with people, resulting in numerous letters and conversation books, many of which have survived, providing incredible insight into Beethoven's life and music. For instance, in a letter to a friend, he vocalized his social struggles and his concern over his future on account of losing his hearing. For two years, I have avoided almost all social gatherings because it is impossible for me to say to people, I am deaf. If I belonged to any other profession, it would be easier, but in my profession, it is a frightful state. He went on to say that, of course, I am resolved to rise above every obstacle, but how will it be possible? In the end, Beethoven's ability to hear for much of his life and mastery over his musical composition during that time enabled him to continue to compose new music while deaf as noted. However, both his performances and ability to conduct suffered irreparably with devastating financial implications. Beyond the aforementioned accounts of his final instances of attempting to conduct, Beethoven's final personal public performance took place in April of 1814, playing his so-called Archduke Trio, known formally as Beethoven's Piano Trio in B-flat made Opus 97. Composer Louis Spohr had this to say after watching a rehearsal for this performance. On account of his deafness, there was scarcely anything left of the virtuosity of the artist which had formerly been so greatly admired. In forte passages, the poor deaf man pounded on the keys until the strings jangled, and in piano he played so softly that whole groups of notes were omitted, so that the music was unintelligible unless one could look into the piano forte part. I was deeply saddened at so hard a fate. Beethoven passed away in 1827. During an autopsy, they found that his auditory nerves had atrophied and eustachian tube was narrowed. This certainly explained why he was deaf, but not what had caused it. Beethoven himself would commonly blame it on gastrointestinal problems or typhus. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out another channel I'm doing called Biographics. If you've enjoyed this longer video about Beethoven, you'll probably enjoy our videos on Biographics, where we cover other notable historic figures. I'm going to link to it below. And thank you for watching.